with verse 27. What is verse 1? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Verse 27, the B part of the verse, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Something invisible, something not seen is the same. Yes? Talk back to me. Okay. So what we have is a connection of verse 1 with verse 27. Okay? And the writer is bringing these two together to define faith for us. So something that is not seen with the eyes of flesh is evidenced by what occurs through the eyes of faith. Okay? Things happen that we don't often see, but know it occurred. It is evidenced by things not seen. We've all been blessed before. Okay? And in that blessing, we didn't see with the eyes of flesh, but we knew what happened was none but God who did. It was evidenced by something not seen, but we knew it occurred because only God could have done that. <laughs> Friends, a girl, you lucked out. Boy, woo, you lucky. And those of us who are spiritually mature know that, oh, no, 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 sister, there ain't no luck. <laughs> That's God working, okay? I didn't see it with these eyes, but through the eyes of faith, I knew it was him. Do I have a witness out here? Somebody. Okay. So the Hebrew writer wants us to know that there's a way to see God even when you don't see him. So Moses was looking for him who is invisible through the eyes of faith, not the eyes of flesh. See, when you see what you see, you don't see all there is to be seen. Okay? All right? So God is calling us to see his perspective through the eyes of faith, not the eyes of flesh. Okay? And we want to see everything before it happens so we know what's going on. And most of the time, if we saw everything, we'd run and hide. God, I got to go through that? So what he does is doesn't show us everything because he know we crazy. And so we be all somewhere all messed up. But when we see it through his perspective, we're okay with that because our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. Okay? So today we want to make a few points about the, the contrast of seeing with your eyes of flesh Versus seeing with the eyes of faith. So he connects verse 1 and 27 together so that we too can look as Moses looked. Okay? Now, think about life before the credit card. Just think about it. How many of you remember Giant Tiger on 83rd and Euclid? How many of you remember Zares on Northfield Road? Uncle Bill's. Value City. Woolworths. Keith, did they have a Woolworths in Chicago? Okay, okay, okay. So, before the credit card, we wanted something, we saw it, and so what we did is we went to one of them stores with Okay, said, I want that polyester suit. Keith wanted that polyester suit to impress Sister Kim. Okay, so he goes into Woolworths, puts $5 down, and then they would write his name on the card, hang it up on the hanger, take it to the back room. Okay, you don't own it yet, but you, you will when you get through paying for it. See, this was before the uh, credit card. All my young folk don't understand that, okay? But uh, the old heads, we remember. That's what we would do. 
It was called a layaway plan. Is that right, Brother Richard? Okay, so every time you got paid, Sister Jasmine, you would go to Woolworths and put $5 down. Okay, they would mark it up, and then you'd that much closer to paying it off. In about eight months, you'd had a thing paid off. Okay. Then you get the suit. Okay. But that was life before the credit card. Okay. So faith is the same way. Faith is your down payment on what God has promised you. So you are waiting until your faith is built up. Enough to pay for what God wants for you, what he's going to give you. Okay? That's how it works. So now the Hebrew writer takes the people of faith and defines faith by their actions. Why? Because faith without works is what? So, Moses now is in this section because of faith. Okay? In verse 27, faith allows you to see the invisible. For he endured seeing him who is invisible. Faith believes the unbelievable. Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. You remember that? All right. Um, the plague of the firstborn being killed. Verse 29, faith um, believes the impossible. By faith, they pass through the Red Sea as by dry land. Whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were destroyed. God allowed his people to pass through. But when the Egyptians thought they could do it too, he destroyed them. So faith does uh, acquire, uh, allows us to believe what would be impossible. Okay. So verse 27 again. By faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, that's a key word, as seeing him who was invisible. The word in this context, it means to be steadfast, a strength that preserves, and a strength that doesn't give up. Some folk lose faith in God because things appear to be impossible for God to do. What's impossible with man is what? Possible with God, but there are folk who just give up the ship. There are folk who just are not steadfast and endure through whatever God has set before them. Okay? All right? That's a key word. All right? So, verses 24, 25, and 26, and 27. Again, he forsook. It's an explanatory God. Okay? Let me, let me stop for a second. Some of y'all looking at me, you know, they, here we go again. We got to do these words. We got to do these words. Okay. Um, I don't do this all the time. But there's certain times, depending on where we're at in the Bible, where we need to do some digging, some further investigation. Okay. Because some things are set up like that. I don't always do it all the time. However, sometimes it's necessary to bring out the deeper meaning of the context, to go beyond the surface level of what's been said. Sometimes that's necessary, okay? But it depends on where, what you're studying. I'll give you a quick example. You take the book of Romans, you're going to have to bring a lunch for that one, okay? Because Romans has some hot weeds, some tall temper, some deep sea dive, and you're going to have to had a book of Deuteronomy open on the one side while you're looking at Romans because every verse you find is going to take you back, okay, to the law. Hebrews the same way. 
We've been bouncing back and forth. Genesis, okay, Exodus, some of Numbers. When you're dealing with Hebrews and Romans, bring your lunch because you're going to have to do some digging, okay? Now, not all the books are that way, but some have some high content that you're going to have to do some digging, and that's okay, all right? It's okay. Not all the books are that way. You can read the Old Testament like you're reading the narrative because most of it is storylines. David, Goliath, so forth and so on. And you don't have to have a whole lot of Hebrew and, 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 and those kinds of things to understand much of the Old Testament. New Testament is a little bit tougher, but not as much as certain books. Romans and Hebrews are going to be tough. Okay? So y'all quit looking at me like we got to do this again. Okay? Stop it. Stop it. Okay? So we need, we need to do that. So let me give you Bible for what I just said. Okay, Proverbs 2, Proverbs 2, this is Solomon talking. I need everybody to turn there, really do. Proverbs is right after Psalms, Proverbs 2. So let me give you Bible for what I just said, okay, so you'll be okay. We'll just do first four verses, they're not very long, okay. Proverbs 2, if you have it, somebody say amen. amen. Okay, now watch what Solomon says. Okay, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Verse 3, yes, if you cry out for discernment, a very important word, we all need spiritual discernment, amen? Amen. And lift up your voice for understanding if you seek her as silver. Where is silver? Under the ground. You got to go get that. Silver ain't laying on top of the ground. You walk around, oh, there goes some silver. Oh, look at I'm rich. No, you got to dig for that, either the bottom of the sea or into the ground. There's some digging that has to go for You got to work for that and search for her. As for hidden treasures. Where are treasures? You got to dig for treasure. You don't walk around, there's a treasure chest of gold all over. Ah, No, you want silver treasures? You got to go into the ground. You got to bring a shovel, an excavator. You got to dig. You got to work for that. That's too valuable for it to be laying around for anybody to pick up. You got to do some work. Sometimes the hidden treasures of Scripture, you got to do some work to get some understanding. Okay? Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Did y'all see all that? Okay? So some things we can just read. Okay, got it. But some things, Sister Kathy, I got to get my shovel. I got to bring my lunch, and I got to push on the shovel, and I got to dig into the ground until I find what I'm looking for. Sometimes the study of God's word requires us to dig like that. We don't always want to do that because it's work, Yukon. But sometimes if you want to really get what God is saying, it's going to require some digging. Not all the time, but sometime. Everybody all right? Y'all good? Y'all good? Okay, 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 okay. All right, I'll say it. Now, I'm going to go back to digging a little bit. Here we go. Forsook, explanatory gar. What does that all mean? Okay, means this. Whenever, whatever you look at, whatever comes before it, tied into it, to what comes after it. You wouldn't be able to get what comes after it until you have what comes before it. All right, make it plain, Brother Willie. Make it plain. Okay, I'm going to make it plain. Okay. All right, okay. The verse teaches us that the only reason Moses was able to see God was because he turned his back on the world. Okay, 
So let's look at it. Verse 24 of chapter 11 of Hebrews turned his back on the world's prestige, power, prominence, and importance. What do you mean? Look at what the verse says. By faith, when he came of, of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Turn his back on all that. If he lived with Pharaoh and was with Pharaoh, he'd have had all that importance, prestige, okay, power, and prominence. Y'all still with me? Okay. Verse 25, he turned his back on the world's pleasures. How do you know? Look at verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He turned his back on the world's pleasures so he could see God. Okay, how many folk want to do that today? How many folk need to do that today? Verse 26, he turned his back on the world's prosperity. Verse number 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He gave up all of that so that he could see God. Amen, walls and electric lights. Okay, see, that's, that's critical, critical to get. Now, you can't see God until you close your eyes to the world. You can't see God until you close your eyes to the world. Okay, what he did is turned his back on the world what he did was close his eyes to the world. Moses gives us an example of how faith sees the invisible because you can't get what God has for you until you let go of what God don't want you to have. Okay, I'll make it plain. Okay, here you go. Some folk don't have a boo, they baby, because the person they're holding on to isn't the one, but they won't let them go because they think that somebody is better than nobody. So what God has to show you is that that's not true. So he sends somebody to come to you to try to help you see that what you're doing isn't working. And they're telling you, let that joker go. Because he ain't no, it ain't no good. It ain't working. But you can't see the forest for the trees. You're, too, you're in too deep. And you uh, get blinded by what you think is love. But the only thing he loves is to punch you in your face. Two weeks ago, after church, he was talking. And he's, uh, I said, what's up, bro? You, how you doing? He said, man, I got to go down here. One of my relatives, she with this dude, man. He keep punching her. And I got to go down there and see what's happening. Okay. She just won't, we keep telling her to let this cat go. And he just, and she just won't let him go. Last week, talking to John Cox. And we was talking about a multitude of things. And one of the things he brought up, man, I can't believe these women. These women around here let these dudes punch them in their face and they, they, and they just won't. And I don't get it. Then when you try to help them, they tell you to shut up and mind your own business. I said, like, I know I got to preach this. I don't know when, but I know I got to preach this. Okay? Just so happens it's a week later, John. <laughs> okay? But, but this, this is an example we got. God has something for you, but you won't let go. Sometimes it's a job. He's got a better job for you, but you stay there anyway, going through craziness, all right? Then he has to get you fired so you can go to the job that he had for you in the first place. All right, all right. 
All right. All right. All right. Tyler Perry made a movie. I can do bad all by myself. Hello, somebody, anybody seen it but me? I got a couple people. Okay. And what he's trying to portray in the movie, Sister Kim, is that this woman who's played by Ch uh, Chiraji, uh, I just call her Cookie because everybody knows it's an umpire. But anyway, uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, uh, and she's playing the lead role. And what the part of the movie, all right, was to show, you know, she's in this bad relationship, and there's this one cat who's good for her, and he's trying to get with her, but she can't get with him because she went pookie and butchy, and they're messing up her life, and he's trying to show her, cut them dudes off, let them go, so you can get somebody good in your life to help you through. That's what we're talking about. We, when we hold on to stuff that's not good for us, God can't give us what he wants us to have until we let it go. So that's where we're at. Okay? Now, 1 John 2, 15 and 16. We all know it, but let's turn it anyway. Real quick, real quick, real quick. 1 John. 1 John. 1 John 2, 15. You already know it. Let's look at it. We'll make a point about this and move on in the text. Do not love the world. Or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. Okay. Uh, this phrase Love not the world is a subjunctive move. I have to give you that. I have to tell you what it is. This is in my English 101, Sister Kathy. All right. Uh, English freshman English in college. Okay, Dr. Enzel and some of them guys. Remember, Sister Kathy. All right. Subjective move. So here's the deal. There is an action going on, and you're already doing it. And in this case, God would want you to stop. So the text should read, love not the world. What it really means is stop loving the world. Stop doing it. Stop loving the world. That's what it's saying. That's what it means. Stop doing all that. Stop loving the world. Stop Loving the lust of the flesh. Stop loving the lust of the eye. Stop loving the pride of life. Okay? Now let's show you how Moses, how all this applies to Moses. Verse 25, the lust of the flesh, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the passing pleasures of sin. Lust of the flesh. Okay? All right? Uh, verse 26, lust of the eyes, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater, richer than the treasures in Egypt. He looked to the reward, lust of the eyes, pride of life is really verse 24. By faith, when he became of age, he refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, the pride of life, all the prestige, honor, and power that was gone with that. I hope you got it. You know, uh, and, 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 and what Moses did and, and what the world represents to him was the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. That's what it, left, that's what it represented to him. So Moses rejects Pharaoh and all that came with it, the sin for a season, uh, because it reflected the world to him. And so should it reflect the world to us. So what's going on here? Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. I'm going to read verse 20. Uh, 20 I'm going to read verse um, 26 again. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to 
the reward. Amen. So let me help you with that. I know you missed it because nobody shouted when I read it. But, right? The Hebrew Christians all wanted to go back to the Old Testament. Moses and Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, they wanted to leave Christ. It was familiar to them with those Old Testament characters. Okay, They wanted to leave Christ, and the Hebrew writer lets us know that Moses was looking for Christ. They wanted to leave Christ. Moses was looking for him. He put Jesus in the Old Testament. That's why I know you missed it. Nobody shouted. He could have said or should have said, you know, the reproach of God. But he said the reproach of Christ. Significant. You know what's significant? Because he puts Jesus in the Old Testament the very person they wanted to avoid, the very thing they wanted to go back to, the Hebrew writer says, no, you want to go back there, and but you want to get away from Christ. Guess what? Christ is part of the Old Testament too. You want to leave Christ, Moses was looking for Christ. He should have said looking for God. No, no, he's looking for Christ. Let me read another passage to you. Turn to John 8. I do need you to turn there. Don't lose. Don't lose Hebrews. But John 8. John 8, Jesus is having a conversation with the Jews, and it's a hot conversation. Man, are they mad at him? And he gets a little upset too. Okay? No, he gets a lot upset. He said, y'all think y'all mad about me? Wait till I tell you some other stuff. You're going to be really mad. Okay. John 8, starting with verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him, do you not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Okay. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is only one who seeks and judges. Let me drop down to verse 52. They said, are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? They mad. They are hot at him making this claim. And Jesus answered him, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him, and he keeps his word. You don't think them folk upset? Now watch this verse. Your father, this is verse 56, John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. So John records this conversation to let the Jews know that Jesus was somebody that Abraham was looking for too. So the Hebrew writer puts Jesus in the Old Testament. This conversation reflects Christ. Being a, and if you're taking a Godhead class, you already know this. Okay? If you haven't taken it, then it, it's, a, you need, it's good. You should. Okay? Godhead class, and I had my book. And left it when I went in to change my coat and left it. I could have shown you some pages. And I, we'll do that more tonight. But 
the Hebrew writer in John records this conversation so that everybody knows that Jesus is God. That's the point. Because he's throughout all scripture. You find him everywhere. So that's where we are at. Okay. There's no Bible. Okay. When they heard that, they were already mad. And in verse 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They already knew that there was God. Because what did God, what did, what did the burning bush, uh, uh, hey, I am. Okay. Well, Moses said, asked him, well, who should I tell you? Well, tell him that I am, that I am has sent you. They already knew what that meant. They so upset, they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, so he passed by. That's all I'm trying to do is get you to show. So folk who are want to hold on to the Old Testament and miss Jesus need to understand that you, if you go back to the Old Testament, Jesus is there anyway. Okay? All right? Everybody with me? We still together. I ain't lose too many, right? Okay. Endured. But here's, here's critical. Critical word. We're back to Hebrews 11. Okay? This is critical. Okay? Endured. Endured. He gave you the definition, but here's the, here's the practical application. There was an event in the past that had results in the past that still is having results in the present that will continue to have results in the future. That's what it means. Okay? Now, let me help you. That's what it means. There was a time when Moses saw God and it set the tone for him for everything else for the rest of his life. God, and it set the tone for everything else in his life. Okay? How many times did Moses see God once at the burning bush? But here's what he did in this so ever present so it was like he was seeing God every day. That one experience allowed him to focus on every day that God gave him to see God in that day every day. And that's what happened. with the eyes of flesh you have to see God with the eyes of faith you can only see the invisible with the eyes of faith now this, this, this is one of the great texts of scripture to point this out find 2 Kings chapter 6 okay right after Samuel before Chronicles 2 Kings or 2 Kings 6 Okay, you might remember this. This is Elisha who has succeeded Elijah. Okay, Elijah was the one on Mark Carmel and the prophets and the burnt. Yeah, that, that's Elijah. Elijah was the, with the Zarephath, 1 Kings 17. And that's Elijah. Well, Elijah's time came to an end. So here comes Elisha. Elijah performed eight miracles. And when he was being chosen, asked God, said, Elijah, listen, I want to do double what you did. So Elijah did eight, which means Elisha would do what? Sixteen. Okay. So that's where we're at in this part of the scripture. Okay. Elisha now is the the, the the man prophet of God. Elisha. Second King 6. Well, the Syrians were coming to attack Israel. 
Israel to conquer them. Okay? And they were trying to Syria, trying to find, well, what's going to, how come they know? And, and, his, and his, his servant said, there's a guy named Elisha that's telling uh, Israel, the king of Israel, all that you're thinking about. He said, well, I got to go get this cat because he's messing up my, he's putting salt in my game. I got to go get him. Okay? I got to go get him. We're around verse number eight, moving down forward. Okay. Verse thirteen, the king is uh, the the king of Syria is told that he Elisha is in Dothan. Okay. He sent his men. He came by night to the city. That's verse forty. Okay. Now watch this. In just a couple of verses. Everybody not everybody in two Kings six. Okay. All right. Uh they came to the city in verse 14. When the servant of God, so Elisha's servant now is posing a question. He rose up and went out, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant s- said to him, Elias, O oh master, what shall we do? That's verse 15. Now watch this one. 16. So Elijah answered, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Critical. Critical to know. Okay. All right. Watch what happens in the next verse. Okay. This is where my grandma would come in. Let's see. Now. His eyes of flesh are already open. What he sees is the army of the Syrians surrounding them with his eyes of flesh. Elijah prays to open up his eyes, not the eyes of flesh, but the eyes of faith. How do you know? Look at the finish the rest of the verse. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. What did he see? And behold, the mountain was full of horses, chariots of fire all around Elijah. So here's what happened. Elisha and his servants were surrounded by the Syrian army. Elisha and his servants could see. But Elisha said, open up his eyes, because what he needs to see is the angels in the mountains that have surrounded the Syrians with flaming souls ready to get them. Then when Lord answered his prayer, he saw what Elijah already knew. That God had this thing already. See, when you look with the eyes of faith, you get to see the invisible. Like Moses did. Okay? Because when you look with the eyes of faith, you or eyes of flesh, you only see what there is to be seen. When you look through the eyes of faith, you see that which is not seen evidenced, evidenced, you know it's God doing it, even though you can't see with your fleshly eyes. Talk back to me now. Y'all all right? That's what he prayed. And so for us, going to 
to 2024, we got to quit looking with just these eyes. We got to see God from his perspective of what he's doing in our lives so that we too can have our eyes open to what he's doing in our lives. Folk won't be you be telling, hey, you got lucky. Yeah, no. It's God doing this thing. It's evidenced by what's happened. You can see it, but it's going on. So that's what happened. That's what happened. And so the story goes on. Uh, Elijah prayed, prayed for the enemy's eyes to be closed. You know, Elisha said, okay, y'all. I'll Y'all don't want me. I'm the wrong dude. Let me take you to Samaria, who, who you really want. And then they followed him. And then when they got to Samaria, he said, God, now open their eyes. They can leave me alone. And I can go back to where I was at. And then they didn't bother him no more. Okay, that's the end of the story. The point is, I want you to see the spiritual eyes of faith. Let me give you one. Where's my, uh-oh. Let me see where, where's my thing at? Ah! Ah, ah, time to go, time to go, time to go. Let me do. No, we'll stop. Okay, uh, twenty. Remember Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat. All right, the battle's not ours but God's. Everybody remember that? We've heard many sermons and lessons on that. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, real quick, uh, they're they're in a mess. And Jehoshaphat know this great multitude, verse 12, oh, our God, you, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but open our eyes are upon you, but our eyes are upon you. Not the eyes of flesh, but the eyes of faith. Okay? Okay? All right? Ephesians us to have the perspective. Ephesians 1 says, of our spirit speak. Okay, Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 and 17, Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The scriptures is calling for us to look with the eyes of faith so that we can know what God has for us. Okay? All right, I'm about to sit down. Peter, walking on the water. The Lord is walking on the water. Peter's like, I want to play. Can I come out too? So, yeah, come on, Peter. He said, bid me to come. You bid me to come, I'll come. Peter's walking, right? So he's walking, and the winds and the waves start acting a fool, okay? And he starts paying attention with his eyes on the winds and the waves. He get all scared and crazy, and then he takes his eyes off of Jesus and, and, and starts to sink. Let me tell you, when you stop looking to Jesus, everything you do is going to go down. You're going to sink. Your life will not be what it needs to be. Okay? You have to keep your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Okay? When you take your eyes off him and start looking at the things happening around you, okay, your circumstances, and you get all caught up crazy in a tizzy over all the stuff happening to you, you have taken your eyes off Jesus and onto your problems. When you do that, 
is like Peter looking at the winds and the waves and wondering what's about to happen and took his eyes off of where he should have had them at. As long as he was looking for Jesus, he was good. As long as you're looking for Jesus, you're good. When you start looking at, you know, light bills and car notes and all that kind of stuff, it's going to be a problem. Okay? He goes down. And it's not until Jesus reaches his hands to save him. And that's what he's looking for. Pull us away from all that stuff that we're distracted by. It's keeping us from focusing on him because we're looking with the wrong eyes. See? I trust that you have gotten what the Lord wants you to know about how to see. How to see. From here on, how to see. Okay, let's see like God wants us to see in this year coming up. Is y'all all right with that? If you're not a Christian today, you can become a Christian by understanding, having your eyes open to knowing that God has a plan of salvation for you. In the same chapter we're in, in Hebrews 11:6, the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please.